Yo, this is Sumex Anderson Anderson. You're watching Title Match Network. Boom. My wife at the time wanted me to be WWE only. And I didn't want to do that. I was captivated by going to different countries. I was enthralled. So I wanted to be Mr. International. I wanted to be the first American you thought about when you went to when you, when you saw Japanese wrestling. I wanted to be the first American you, you saw or even thought of when you see AAA. I want to be the first American you thought of when you see IWA in Puerto Rico. That was my long-term goal. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted every language that watches wrestling to know her, who Hernandez was. Or just like this, like how everyone knows who Brick Flair, who everyone knows Bret Hart, you know, Shawn Michaels and so on. That's what I wanted. I go, man, because I mean, I, I was kind of busy seeing Bob Sapp in Japan. I'm at the little convenience store, there's Bob Sapp ice creams. There's Bob Sapp rap albums, you know, in Japan. I wanted that for myself. I, the WWE thing, I, it was never, it was maybe a secondary dream. Just, you know, please don't get mad, guys. Just keep the wife quiet. <laughs> and it seems like your wife was probably pretty happy when you got a couple of those uh, dark matches in the oh, early, yes. early 2000s. Yes. Can you tell us about how that came about or how you were approached for this? Well, there's a lot, you know, I saw, I'm going to tell you some more grandpa stories. <laughs> now, you know, they contact you through social media or, you know, your tapes you put on or your moves you do on viral on your social media. Back then it was different. Um, Ken Taylor was the promoter of NWA Southwest, and he had the contact for when WB came into Texas. So he would work out a deal with you. He would say, hey, I need you to do, if I get you these tryouts and you're guaranteed to make 250 bucks just by showing up, he can one you know, bargain with you. He said, all right, all right, I need you to do two or three shows free for me <laughs> to get that. So I never forget myself. I wouldn't do that. I said, I'll take less money. Shows, but I can't do it free because I'm in Houston and I'm not driving to Dallas free. So I took less money those two or three shows. And myself, some other guys, and the infamous Neko Butcher were there for the um, indie guy, indie local talents. So they would line you up like a prison lineup. And the two or three guys that had like a heat match or velocity or whatever you called it back then, they were just like a drill sergeant look up and down who looked like they knew how to work. Because back then they wouldn't let you get in the ring. So it was between me and Neko Bush. <laughs> just on looks, looks alone. Who's going to have a match against Crash Hopkins? And God rest his soul, Crash picked me. And he led me through a five, six minute good match, kicking and screaming because I had no idea what I'm doing. He literally called everything in the ring because TV wrestling was a way different ball game than what I was doing on, on the Indies. And after I did my match, um, Doc Hendricks, a.k.a. Mike Hayes, Man, that was good, kid. That was good. Are you in the next show? Well, no, I was on the book for this one. I'm sorry. I was like, oh, man, oh, I'm going to keep you in mind for next time. Oh, please do. Thank you so much. And I go home and tell the wife, hey, I'm on the radar. Are you happy? Yeah. And that was the first time. It was pretty cool, pretty cool experience, but not what I, exactly what I was looking for, but it, it worked out really well. Was that initial match with Crash Holly, not just because you're on TV, yeah. but Crash, from what I remember, was a lot smaller yeah. than you were. Mm -hmm. So you're a big guy wrestling a smaller yeah. guy, and you're, you're supposed to go under too. Yeah. Uh, did this did this affect the match at all, or did, no. you know? Crash Holly used perfect psychology. He had me, he, you know, he's a, you know, a classic veteran. He wanted to beat someone. Because we were the match right before Raw went live. So we had, everybody was in their seat. Everybody was in their seat. So everyone watched it because they know the Raw is thinking start live. And he was, he knew the size of the was diff, was a little awkward. And he had me controlling for most of the match. And 
So I, when he beat me, the crowd exploded. It was really good. And then, hurry up, kid, get out of here, get out of here, because we got to put the power on for Raw. So <laughs> it was awesome. That's cool. And, and they must have liked you because you came back again for another match on, I guess it was Jacked at yep. the time they and, called it. And you wrestled Haku. Can you tell us about this? Was it the same kind of situation where they kicked you out of a lineup? Oh, you? yes. Oh, really? Oh, yes. You know, so big cat lineup. So um, I think it was Kevin Kelly was in charge of the time. I was, Kevin, what do you need me to do, sir? I was so big. Okay. <laughs> not what move, not nothing, just sell for this monster. And it was a monster, and it was exactly the six minute squash you needed to be. Then I did a dark match. Maybe the next time they came to San Antonio, I wrestled Joey Abs. And that was beginning to the end because Tony Gurria was the agent for that match. He goes, Hernandez, I see you do that big dive outside. He goes, yes, sir. He goes, uh, can you do it tonight? Because yeah, I'm more in San Antonio. You know, Hernandez, a big Mexican crowd. I go, yeah. And again, match right before Raw. Outside looking in, only a dumbass would do that. Because only, you know, back in those, you know, in the most money making days, only certain move, certain wrestlers did certain moves. Back then, no one but the Undertaker would dive over the top. So I didn't think nothing of it. I said, oh man, I gotta get some offense. I'm excited. So man, I hit that dive. The people, San Antonio obviously got really excited. And the match was okay, it wasn't great, but it was okay. And so I came with the back, go to the back and try to get my feedback. Man, it was like a funeral. Nobody wants to say nothing to me. And we're looking the other way, looking down. I go, what the fuck? I only did what I was told to do. Which, I mean, I know it wasn't a masterpiece match, but it can't have been that bad. And then I was informed <laughs> that maybe I should have did the dive. Well, I didn't know that I could say no. I mean, there's, I'm trying to make money, you know, get myself seen just like everyone else. And this man, who's, I, who I think is in charge, because he's got an agent jacket on, and he's telling me to do this dive, I did it. And literally, no one would talk to me until, ha until about half the show was over. So for the fans that don't know, I mean, like back in the day, there was – you're not supposed to go out of the ring in the early matches. You're not supposed to do... There's a whole list of things you mm -hmm. need to save for the main event. Yes, sir. So here you are before the show, really. Yes. And you're diving and you're taking mm -hmm. a move that the one of the main stars had. Oh, yes. Oh, man. And all I was thinking in the time, because, oh, well, I got permission. And not knowing rules and etiquette. You know, when... When I first got to the building, everyone's shaking my hand, feeling, you know, from the top stars down. Man, after my match, I'm literally passing the hallway like this. And no, everyone's, you know, it's maybe from this microphone to here, how big the hallway is. And everyone's screwed out of the way, so they'll have to make no eye contact with me. I'm like, fuck. So was that, was that your last appearance there? Or did you come back for more? No, I did last appearance there. Um... I believe I went to Japan and I sent a tape to Kevin Kelly. This is a great story. I sent a, a tape to Kevin Kelly from my all Japan experience. And I had no idea that Kevin Kelly was let go or fired or something and Tom Pritchard took over. So he became the head, head of town relations. I had no clue. So, but my package was, you know, back then you had to send the big ass envelope with a VHS tape, promo pics, height, weight, all that stuff. So I, I didn't send the promo picture because Kevin knows who I am, so I sent the tape. This is before, I'm gonna tell you another grandpa story. Before everyone had a cell phone, we had landlines. So I'm sitting by my computer, phone rings, I look on the caller ID, Stanford, Connecticut. This is my shot. This is my shot. This is my motherfucking shot. 
I'm God. You know what I'm saying? Like, hello. <laughs> Sean Hansen going, yes, sir. This is Tom Pritchard, WB. And then for the next five minutes, read me a new ass about how I need to, you know, send promo pics and make sure everything's addressed to him because he's head of town relations. And then it got gloomy, or slightly, you know, downright rough. He goes, ah, you need to change your hold up too, kid. We already have one ball badass. You ever heard of Stone Cold Steve Austin? And then, I, like anyone else, I had all I could take. I go, sir, please do me a favor. I'm never call my house again. I'm up. 2002 or three, and I never heard from WB ever since. But you, you know, there was a principle of it too. You're not just going to get. Uh... I was in shock. You know, I guess because I was on such a high, the old man here stand for calling me, and then I wasn't expecting Tom Pritchard to flex on me about I need to do it this way, this way, this way, this way, and then brother, I'm bald. I must, <laughs> I must have changed my whole look because I you ever heard so cool? I go, man, I go, man, just please never come house bro. And I knew that was it. That I've seen guys. You know, and I've heard stories where guys not got called back for less. So you're going to tell a talent agent, please don't call my house again. And I just, that submitted my life to our man. You want to be Mr. National? You've got no choice now. Because <laughs> now you really have no backup plan. So you know, there's some loading them trucks again. So you knew you had to go a different path then. Um, this is also, I wanted to point out, it was also an interesting time too, because I knew a lot of guys right around that 2001 mark when WWE, it was, I think you had that match with Haku about within a week of mm-hmm. WWE purchasing mm-hmm. WCW. So now you have all this other talent coming in to compete with. How tough was that? Did you did you uh, know going into that, like this is going to be a lot tougher now? I was, I was show shocked because I wanted to be in ECW. I used to go to ECW shows when I went to Louisiana trying to get in. And then, you know, ECW shuts down, then WCW gets bought, and I go, man. <laughs> Just being honest, take your ass to Mexico. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did. You know, I just, the numbers game, because you, you, know, you have all the top talent from WWF or WWE at the time, and you have WCW and ECW all looking for jobs. They're not looking for nothing new. You know, they're... You're know, oversaturated with guys, so took my ass across the border, put a mask on, and Mr. Texas was born. Yo, the Supermax Hernandez. You want to see more? Click that subscribe button right now. To live and die in LAX. TitleMatchNetwork.com.